All right, welcome everyone. I'm glad we have some folks here in person because when we heard it was gonna rain, we were very worried um, that we were gonna have um, only uh, folks with us on the stream. So welcome to you too in your dry homes um, and to everyone who's here with us together today. Um, <clears throat> I wanna start by thanking Brooke for helping us put together this program today. We have, um, we have a, uh, a number of programs that we're participating in this year in order to um, celebrate Dr. King and his legacy, which feels in many ways more important than ever um, to lift up. And we wanted to use this opportunity to really hear from some of the leaders of our own community who are black and Jewish, who are holding um, both of those sides of their own identity and, and navigating their way through that. Um, I wanna just start with words of thanks, because we've learned so much in the last decade. Um, I think in some ways there's been a great awakening in the country, and there's certainly been a, a great awakening in the Jewish community. And we have this incredible um, racial justice and inclusion team, Eddie Carr, that several years ago um, really decided that we needed to put our heads together to figure out what kind of reckoning needed to happen internally at Icar in our own Jewish community so that we could actually manifest the values of beloved community that we so seek to achieve and to realize out in the broader world. And this group um, has, has really done some incredible work in, in part of a conversation with a much broader um, community of activists and educators and thinkers throughout the country who are doing this work to try to figure out what does it really mean to be anti-racist? What does it mean to build a Jewish community that's leadership actually reflects what the broader Jewish community looks like, um, that breaks the myth of the white, cisgendered, heterosexual, wealthy Jew, um, which we all know isn't true, um, and yet that's what the leadership of our, the national leadership of our Jewish community often uh, reflects back as. And part of the work that came out of that, and, and, and Eric and Marissa have been involved um, in leading that effort here along with others in our community for years, is that very often um, a few things happen in the broader Jewish community. When MLK Day comes, we bring in black pastors to talk about um, the legacy of the racial justice struggle in America, as if there aren't black Jews to talk about that legacy. And when black Jews are invited to speak in synagogue, it's often about uh, what it means to be a black Jew in, in a congregation, uh, in, in a Jewish community that's often perceived to be a white community or majority white. And and what we, what we don't do enough of is bring in black Jews to teach Torah and to talk about our Jewish tradition, our Jewish heritage, um, to reflect on the words of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, for example, on his 50th yard site, which we're marking this week, and to think about what his legacy is, um, to talk about uh, the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King and the work that lies ahead. So we're doing all of those things here. Um, we very deliberately invited uh, three black Jewish leaders in our community. So we are centering uh, the voices um, of black Jews, but we're not inviting you here only to talk about what it means to be a black Jew, but also just to talk about what it means to be alive in the world today, because um, we, we feel it's really important to hear um, these voices, especially um, given the lived reality and the work uh, that all of you have done. So I'm gonna take a moment to just introduce um, the, the, th the three uh, folks who sit here to my left. Um, and then we're gonna look at excerpts from one sermon and one speech, um, a sermon that was given by Dr. Martin Luther King, um, which I have cited uh, many times before. It's one of my favorite of Dr. King's sermons called The Death of Evil Upon the Seashore. Um, and, and then a, an excerpt from a speech that uh, Rabbi Ibram Joshua Heschel gave um, a, about a decade later. And you'll hear why we chose those two. Um, and then we're gonna just use these texts as sacred text and, and as an opening for discussion. So um, I'm very excited to be in this conversation with three really dear friends um, and people who, as I said, are real leaders in our own uh, community at Icar and, um, and in Los Angeles. Um, first is Marissa G trained as a lawyer, um, who now works as a trainer, trainer and I would say healer in many ways, um, who has really been on the forefront of the racial justice and inclusion work in our community now for many years, and we're deeply grateful to you, and is also part of being trained nationally um, to do this work in a, in a much bigger national cohort. Um, 
and, uh, and a member of ECAR's board of directors, um, along with Eric Green, who is also a member of ECAR's board of directors. So I'll skip to Eric next. Um, Eric is uh, an educator and a racial uh, justice advocate um, who w really has worked tirelessly since before it was popular to bring this conversation deep into the heart of communities, not so that um, we can hold guilt, not so that we can uh, hold shame, but so that we can be better. And we are better as a result of your voice and your wisdom, and I'm deeply grateful to you. Um, and, and it's wonderful to have you on our board of directors as well. Um, and my friend Jacqueline Hamilton, um, who may be a future board uh, a, a member of ECAR. Um, Jacqueline, who, uh, who worked with uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass uh, for many years, and now will be starting next week working with Mayor Karen Bass, um, who uses um, her incredible wisdom and life experience to make our city and our country a better and safer and more just and more loving place. And we're just, we love having you in our community and it's been a great blessing um, to, have, to get to know you over the course of many years and I'm thrilled to have you in this conversation today. Um, so welcome, this is our great panel today. Okay, so a quick, a quick word of background as you can see on the sheet here, by the way, um, it, it's not easy to, um, to trim the words of either Dr. King or Rabbi Heschel. Um, so these were much longer speeches and lectures, but I, I, I had to edit them down a little bit. I hope I captured uh, their essence. If you didn't get the sheet, you will. If you're with us online, uh, we'll post the source sheet afterwards, but you can also look it up. Um, the, the text from Dr. King is, again, called The Death of Evil Upon the Seashore, and the text from Heschel is from the Conference on Race and Religion. Um, and it's called uh, Religion and Race. Okay, so a brief word of background. Dr. King delivered this sermon on May 17th, 1956, before 12,000 people who were gathered uh, in New York City at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. Um, and, uh, and this was just two years after Brown v. Board of Ed, and it was a monumental sermon. It's a theme that Dr. King returned to again and again. It wasn't the first time that he had preached these words, but he was beginning to really hone this message. And you'll see uh, why we wanted to, um, to start with this. Um, and, and the Heschel speech, um, the Heschel speech was given in 1963, so, um, so several years later, but this was at the Conference on Religion and Race in Chicago, and it was at this conference that he met Dr. K uh, Dr. King for the first time, and they became really dear friends. They only knew each other for five years before Dr. King died, um, but this was a real relationship, and, um, and you can see in their writings um, why it is that they found such an affinity with one another, why it is that Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who was, um, as they say, pl uh, you know, plucked from the ashes of Europe, who, uh, who was able to get a visa to come to the United States um, when most of his family was murdered in, um, by the Nazis in Europe, why it was that he felt such an immediate affinity to uh, the civil rights leaders, a black church-driven movement uh, for racial justice here, for, um, for black folks in America, and a transformative movement for justice in America, and, and why he immediately felt an attachment to Dr. King based on, uh, based on theology, based on, uh, and, and based on their understanding of both God and human beings. So I wanna use this as a jumping off point um, for us to begin to talk, and, um, and uh, I'll, I'll start us off here. Oh, and the reason that we, I'll just give you the, uh, the answer to the, to the big mysterious question right at the start, which is, if you were here for services earlier today, um, perhaps you noted that we began today reading from the book of Exodus from Parshat Shemot, um, the great narrative of our people, which really stands at the heart of liberation theology, um, the story that, as, as um, political scientist Michael Walter says, wherever there are oppressed people, the story of the exodus from Egypt has found its way into the popular consciousness and the association of those who struggle with the Israelite people enslaved to Pharaoh is a, is a strong and profound association that crosses time and space. Um, and of course, found its way into the heart of black church theology and, uh, and the theology of the um, civil rights movement. So, um, so I will start, Dr. King starts with, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. Um, chapter 14, um, verse 30 of the book of Exodus, which we did not read this morning, but we'll read in a couple of weeks. 
Um, and and just to give us a sense, and you can take the text home and read the read it in full later. We're not going to um, right now, but he uses the opportunity of the Egyptians who pursued the Israelites in their um, in their march toward freedom and drowned in the sea because of their stubborn insistence that they could have a stranglehold over other human beings. And they, and they followed them into the water and then drowned in the water that seeing their bodies washed up on the seashore meant something to Dr. King about who we are as Americans and about the dream that we're pursuing here in this place. And what he establishes in that moment is that the whole history of life is the history of a struggle between good and evil. And he points to ways in, uh, in his tradition and in other traditions that that struggle manifests. But what I'd like for us to start with right now, and perhaps one of you can read this, uh, just the first couple of paragraphs on page two, is how he draws out, in particular, the story of the Exodus from Egypt and what he reads into it that could be very relevant for us um, in this moment. So if one of you is happy to read this, um, or we can take a paragraph Starting each where? from a graphic example on page two. Uh, a graphic example of this truth is found in an incident in the early history of the Hebrew people. You will remember that at a very early stage in her history, the children of Israel were reduced to the bondage of physical slavery under the gripping yoke of Egyptian rule. Egypt was the... Egypt was the symbol of evil in the form of humiliating oppression, ungodly exploitation, and crushing domination. The Israelites symbolized goodness in the form of devotion and dedication to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These two forces were in a communal struggle against each other. Egypt struggling to maintain her oppressive yoke, and Israel struggling to gain freedom from this yoke. Finally, however, these Israelites, through the providence of God, were able to cross this, the Red Sea and thereby get out of the hands of Egyptian rule. The Egyptians, in a desperate attempt to prevent the Israelites from escaping, had their armies to go in the Red Sea behind them. But as soon as the Egyptians got into the Red Sea, the parted waves swept back upon them, and the rushing waters of the sea soon drowned all of them. As the Israelites looked back, all they could see was here and there a poor drowned body beaten, beaten upon the seashore. For the Israelites, this was a great moment. It was the end of a frightful period in their history. It was a joyous daybreak that had come to end the long night of their captivity. You go on. Two more paragraphs. This story symbolizes something basic about the universe. It symbolizes something much deeper than the drowning of a few men. For no one can rejoice at the death or the defeat of a human person. This story at bottom symbolizes the death of evil. It was the death of inhuman oppression and ungodly exploitation. Go on. The death of the Egyptians upon the seashore is a glaring symbol of the ultimate doom of evil in its struggle with good. There is something in the very nature of the universe, which is on the side of Israel in its struggle with every Egypt. There is something in the very nature of the universe, which ultimately comes to the aid of goodness it's in, per in its perennial struggle with evil. Right, so the first thing, I, I think this is so powerful, and I just want to note that this is not something to be taken for granted in the story. There are a lot of people, even today, who read the story of the Exodus from Egypt that we uh, began to read this morning, and they don't see in this a paradigm that can, be, uh, that, that can be extrapolated for all human history, lessons to be learned. They see in it a moment in time, almost as if it's a recording of history, and, and by the way, this is not a radical view. I, there are a lot of people who, who read the text this way. It's a moment in history. It's telling us a certain story. It's the origin story of the Jewish people, but it has nothing to do with people who aren't Jewish people. And it has nothing to do with the Jewish people today. It has to do with the Jewish people back then. And so it's pretty remarkable already what Dr. King is doing. And I wonder if, if, if this evokes some thought in you already, and we'll just, I'm gonna, we're gonna sort of walk through the ideas, but please jump in at any moment. If this... Um, if the way that Dr. King is reading this narrative strikes you in some way um, as, as remarkable or resonates for you when he talks about there's something in the nature of the universe that ultimately comes to the aid of goodness in its perennial struggle with evil, reading that text as very present and very current and not a reflection of history and very universal, not a reflection of one people's story, but rather all oppressed people's story. 
Well, I'll tell you, it strikes me that um, he's making this sermon flush with the victory of Brown versus Board of Education, just on the two-year anniversary and with the excitement in the air of, of all the promise that that meant and, and what that would mean. And he doesn't speak with a sense of inev- inevitability of the defeat of evil, but in a sen- he has a sense of the destiny of the defeat of evil and the triumph of liberation and the triumph of good. And I'm struck by the difference between the tone of this when he's looking at that moment in the Exodus story and then the speech he gives the night before he's assassinated, uh-huh. aware of his own impending doom when he's still talking about Exodus, but he's talking about Moses looking into the promised land, but not able to cross over into the promised land. And there's still that sense of, of promise, but that sense of his own mortality and all of the all of the bumps in the road that get in between that moment at the sea and the moment of ultimate redemption. You know, it was this speech was before you know, billions of dollars and thousands of men were siphoned off into the war in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. It's before um, a lot of the, the the backlash and the nullification to push back against the the efforts of the civil rights movement. So I'm I'm struck by that moment of promise that he's really picking up on, and it's interesting. In, in a lot of ways, the text from Heschel, which we'll get to five years later, shares some of that sense of the the the, the destiny of 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 liberation and of good to triumph over evil, but is I think exercise you know I- expressing some more of the frustrations with the difficulties of actually making that happen mm-hmm. and the pace the slow pace at which change um, uh, occurs. So to, to to think about the, the the invocation of the text at that historical moment and what was to come for me is fascinating. And it does feel it feels hopeful, right? It's a hopeful moment, and yet when we look at 1956 and see how much. You know, how much more struggle there was ahead. It, uh, now, in retrospect, it seems like, oh, it may, you know, the death of evil upon the seashore, really? Do you want to see evil? Like, we're just getting started at this point. And um, Rabbi Kesher was talking during service about if Dr. King was a prophet or not, and at least 1 60th of prophecy. But I will tell you, and, and um, Suzanne Heschel points out that she writes an article about the theological affinities between Abraham Joshua Heschel and Dr. Martin Luther King. It's a great piece, which I'll also, I can also post afterwards. Um, and she points out that they both called each other prophets. That's not language that we use lightly. But um, Dr. King came to Abraham Joshua Heschel's birthday party with all the rabbis from JTS. That must have been a blast. And um, and he called him a he called doc, he called Heschel a prophet, and Heschel, of course, called Dr. King a prophet. And part of the work of a prophet is to respond to where the people are in the moment and to feed them something that's different from what they already have. And so, what you're saying, Eric, makes me think about the 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 tension that we've pointed out here many times before in Dr. King's writing between the fierce urgency of now and the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends store justice, but it's long, right? So between we have to do this and we have to do this now, it's the 11th hour, and it's gonna take a really long time before we get there. And it seems like in his speeches, you can sort of track, and sometimes in one sermon, both of those sides. And I wonder if as activists and educators, you also experience this where like, this needs to be fixed now. And so we're gonna fight for one assembly bill that's gonna pass and then go to the, that might lead to more affordable housing being able to be made so that we might be able to get more people to live in dignity. The tension between, I. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna show up Motzei Shabbos today because another young unarmed black man was, you know, was killed by police officers two days ago, right? Like, what does it mean to live in the urgency of this moment? This must stop now versus like, we're gonna start to put the pieces in place so that we can build a more just society and every day we're in progression moving toward that goal, which I think is what you're reflecting in the, the, the tension that he held within his own body. Do you have a thought about that? Um, not that specifically. I was thinking when you were talking about how people uh, don't necessarily identify the Exodus story as continuing to apply. I think that a lot of 
folks do, though, and witnessed by, you preached a sermon, I don't know how long ago, about the slave Bible and how it didn't even have the Exodus story in it, right? Mm -hmm. Because the slave owners didn't want a biblical reference that would say, oh, maybe you should be free. So the Bible that was preached to slaves who were not permitted to read, so it was read to them, was didn't include the Exodus story. Right. Right, because they understood the power of it, right? Like if you're going to tell a story in which God is on the side of the oppressed and the oppressed win, they have victory, like they march toward freedom, you don't want to plant that idea. People will surely revolt. And they did revolt. And, you know, and John Brown had a Bible in his hand, right? When they So so there's a way in which they the slaveholders understood the power of this story. Mm-hmm. At the same time, though, I'm, you know, in this text, King says there is something in the very nature of the universe which ultimately comes to the aid of goodness in its perennial struggle with evil. Yes, but at least in the story, which is what we're examining, um, it's not nature that comes to the aid. It's God. Hmm. It takes. It actually takes a miracle and divine intervention to make this happen because it wasn't happening without it. You know, so... And uh, I know we're going to get to Heschel in a minute, but that gap of seven years between this speech and Heschel's speech um, also shows me that, and where we are now, that history is not a one-way ratchet, Mm. and Mm -hmm. social progress is not a one-way ratchet, Mm -hmm. and we may be on one trajectory, and it can get stopped or derailed, um, Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that goes to the point you were just making, Rabbi, about you know, you do the immediate and you have to take the long view or else you succumb to despair, which Eschel says is the worst sin of all. Yeah, I want to, can I ask you about that, Jacqueline? I want to, because I'm thinking, Brooke, about, you know, our work years ago, like we desperately as a community wanted to work on comprehensive immigration reform. And then there was a Congress uh, that made it clear that, right, Brianna and Marty, like we were not going to get comprehensive immigration reform and we were devastated and felt, you know, felt like, we, but this is what we have to fight for. This is what needs to happen right now. And then, you know, through some very thoughtful lay leaders and and, uh, and and some great wisdom from our director of community organizing, like we were able to refocus toward getting driver's licenses and working like small step, incremental steps that we could take until there was a different Congress and we might have a different kind of opportunity. And you were working with Congresswoman Bass, like, during the Trump administration when she was flying to Washington, D.C. every day. And I just wonder, if, I mean, can you, this is sort of a, a personal question, but you got you got an upfront seat to um, what we were reading about in the, in the press every day. Um, you know, what does it mean to, after eight years of, you know, an Obama presidency, which was a really hopeful time for many people, when there was a sense that there was a, I remember Michelle Obama's, you know, saying like, this is the house that was built by the hands of enslaved people. And, and then it became their home. And so like there was this sense that maybe America was on a redemption path and then, you know, the tide turned. And so how did, how did you see the na- navigating that turn of events and holding power and showing up to work every day and going to the floor of Congress and trying to do the work of, you know, the small, small incremental change or like holding the ship as much as we can, knowing that we're not getting comprehensive immigration reform, let alone many other things that we cared about? Um, it was very rough. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I, I remember on election night when it became clear that Hillary Clinton was not going to win, I called my boss who was at in New York at the you know planned victory party. And I said, I, I don't know how to think about this. I, how, how do I process this? She says, I can't help you right now. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're, it was, it was a big shock. Um, you know, but I think that exemplified by what you were just talking about, the pivot that mm-hmm. broke in the organizing well, team made. That, that you're, you're giving me more credit than I deserve. That, that all happened before I was on staff here. But you were a lay leader. Okay, okay. But, I, but I just want to be clear. That that okay. <laughs> the organizing team yeah. and the yes. community who yes. were involved in social activism, which includes you and Brianna and everybody else who here was part of that, <laughs> nonetheless... Good community organizing, and this is the thing, one of the things that I've really valued about um, working with Karen Bass for nine years, good community organizing means you identify where you're going, what, you're, what you want, and then you try to figure out a path there, but you also have to figure out what's possible now. You have to figure out your, your levers of power, right? And so when 
both the majority in the Congress and the president now have made it clear that we're not getting immigration reform, a thing we've desperately needed for decades, you start doing what you can do. You know, mm -hmm. you focus, you pivot to the things that you can accomplish. Maybe they're smaller, they're not, you know, the Affordable Care Act giving health care to a whole bunch of people, they're getting driver's licenses. But I think you, you just have to constantly regroup, otherwise you succumb to despair. And it's that, I think that for all of us as humans, when we don't feel any agency, that's when the despair comes. Mm -hmm. And so if the agency that you feel is accomplishing something small, then you do something small. So you don't mm -hmm. succumb to that sin of despair. Uh, but, you know, it's it's funny. I've been right now I'm reading Heather McGee's The Sum of Us, S-U-M, Sum of Us. And in it, she the subtitle of the book is something like um, how racism hurts all everyone. Throughout the course of the book, she talks, and I feel like this sort of resonates back with the story of the Egyptians getting washed away, right? Is that when you allow the othering of someone and those people try to defend their own interests and you just keep fighting back, eventually nobody wins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, she talks about this in her chapter on labor, about how as long as, especially in the, sla the states where unions were really, really denigrated, they told a story about lazy black people and the only people who would benefit from labor unions was folks who weren't just stepping up anyway. And since you, white person, are stepping up and working hard, you don't need a union, we got you. It's those other, the, the lazy black folk who want the union because they want to get away, some, they want something for nothing. And as long as we continue to other folks, everybody loses because that means that they could always, anytime there was an organizing effort, they would appeal to the people who were just a little bit above. I, you know, I, I might be dirt poor, I might not have electricity or plumbing, but I'm not black. Mm -hmm. That allows them to build that, to, to shove in that wedge. And the places where racism was overcome and explicitly made part of the organizing, and they would, that, that story that the powers that be told was called out explicitly You're saying, look, they're trying to divide us. This person working next to you on the line, do you see them working any less hard just because they're black? No. So what, what's that story? We all benefit from the union because he doesn't have health care and neither do you. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's that, you know, the way that othering hurts everybody in the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Marissa, do you have a thought about that? Or well, I, I, I was going back to the thought about the fact that um, King's uh, sermon here is actually hopeful and contract. I know we haven't gotten to Heschel's yet, but you, can you know those seven in. those seven years between 1956 when Heschel, I'm sorry, when King is giving his sermon and Heschel's giving his sermon uh, seven years later, um, and how in King's sermon he's he's hopeful and that he he actually says you cannot. Uh, you have to be hopeful. There is no if there's no option not to be because if you're not, then you then there will never be progress, right? Um, where was it? Uh, he he was just saying that um, this is our hope. He says. Yeah. No, uh, I was thinking we must believe. I'm sorry, the story We must believe that a prejudiced mind can be changed, that man can be lifted from the valley. Mm -hmm. um, let us not despair. If you have no, you have to. Otherwise, there's despair, right? And then. Um, Heschel in 1963, with it being 1963, there's a lot more going on, and he is, uh, or you know, uh, and he is um, completely saying, "Look, Exodus is continuing. There's, the Exodus is never finished. None of us are free until mm -hmm. all of us are free." Mm -hmm. And um, and so just that dichotomy, but you you know how you started talking about that dichotomy between the hopeful and then still, even though there's a you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, exit is still going on. We cannot, uh, we have to keep going. I, I think that, um, I mean, do you want to get to Heschel? Ahead, you can bring us. Um, what, what really stuck out, stuck out for me in Heschel's piece, and we were talking about this before, it's on page five. Is that right? Page five? Oh, I didn't. We didn't, we didn't um, we print it the same way? Yeah. Page five. He says, over here, is that okay? Um, 
this conference should dedicate itself not only to the problem of the Negro, but also to the problem of the white man, not only to the plight of the colored, but also to the situation of white people, to the cure of a disease that affecting the spiritual substance and condition of every one of us. What we need is an NAAP, a National Association for the Advancement of All People. Prayer and prejudice cannot dwell in the same heart. Worship without compassion is worse than self deception. It is an abomination. And, you know, we were all talking before meeting with you today about how this sounds like an all lives matter moment. Um, all lives matter. In, but this is 1963. And what, where is that coming from? And what does that mean? And what is it in reaction to, as opposed to the all lives matter statement, what that was a reaction to? Um, and just... Uh, so that's what that's where I was thinking about. Yeah, and I, I I felt the same thing. And as I was reading it, I thought, oh, no, don't go there. Don't go. When I saw NAAAP, I'm like, no, 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 don't say all people because we have this echo now. I wonder, I mean, can one of you explain just to be really explicit about it? Like, what, I mean, the, no, the, the nature of I, all lives matter seems like something that people who believe that all human beings are created in the image of God should be able to get behind. And yet we understand that it's a it's really a manipulation um, of the movement and of the moment. So maybe one of you can explain uh, if you're if if you're if, if well, one of you would like what, what the difference I is. I think Heschel goes to it right below, which is right. race as a normative legal or political concept is capable ex of expanding to formidable dimensions. A mere thought it extends to becoming a way of thinking, a highway of insolence, as well as a standard of values, overriding truth, justice, beauty. As a standard of values and behavior, race operates as a comprehensive doctrine as racism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when we say all lives matter, we're ignoring the 400 years of history of black people being deprived of, every, of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, their very lives. Um, and pretending like we're all starting on an even playing field. Mm -hmm. But the high places have not been uh, made low. The rough places have not plain. You know, we're, we are not at a, uh, an even playing field. And Heschel goes on to say, um, you know, as part of his, we all need to work on this, that um, it's a problem for white people too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key point. And that's the key point that differentiates the move that he's making here from an all lives matter, which is trying to deny the specificity and the urgency of anti-black oppression or the oppression of people of color writ large and saying, well, w we can put this veneer, you know, this veneer of sameness over it. And therefore we don't have to deal with the discomforts of the, the reality of it. And that's very different from what, um, what Heschel is doing here. I mean, in Heschel saying that we needed a National Association for the Advancement of All People, what he is saying here is that this is not just a black problem. Mm -hmm. It is an all of us problem. Mm -hmm. And he is very, very explicit. He goes on to say, we have all, and he, by this he means white people, we have all become accessory before the God of mercy to the injustice committed against the Negroes by men of our nation. Our derelictions are many. We have failed. It's almost the language of Yom Kippur. It's the, the mm -hmm. language of, of accepting responsibility mm -hmm. for collective sin. And he's locating himself very explicitly as a white person who is who needs to be held accountable along with other white people. He's not saying, listen, I'm Jewish and my people suffered, and so this isn't our problem. Eh, it's a white Christian thing. He's not saying, oh, this is a problem of white Southerners. Eh, they need to deal with it. He's saying we, capital W, we have a responsibility. This is impacting all of us. This is our obligation. And, and I was talking a bit with Sharon about this before. It's very resonant to me of this moment of Lyndon Johnson when he gives his speech about voting rights. And you know, every year there's the same five or six, two or three second clips that are shown in Black History Month or Martin Luther King Day about the civil rights movement. And one of those clips is, is, is Johnson on the floor of Congress saying, we shall overcome. And that's read as him giving a statement of solidarity with black Americans and a statement of solidarity with the civil rights movement, which it is in a way, but more specifically, if you look at that speech in its entire context, he is talking to a white Congress about voting rights, and he is talking about the way that African Americans are doing their part to overcome the legacy of oppression, but we have our work to do too. 
and we shall overcome. And in that moment, he's talking as president of white America. He's talking to other white Americans. And he's saying this is not just the job of black Americans. Mm -hmm. They're doing their part. We have to do our part. And that's the same move that Heschel is making here. He's not letting anyone off the hook. And there, there's, a, there's a level of, of insistence. You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, Sharon has said before that the Jewish community is very eager to have soft conversations about race. And I think that Heschel, more than anyone else, would be furious that his name is invoked mm -hmm. as a way of having soft conversations about race and not really doing the hard work to go deeper than just an iconic image or an iconic quote. And then for people to feel like, well, we've done our part because we've invoked the memory That's of right. Abraham, right. Abraham Joshua Heschel, but not done the work of Heschel. And he, he starts off in this... Um, Quoting William Lloyd Garrison, the famous, the famous abolitionist, I will be harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch and I will be heard. That's a different level of forthrightness than I think we're used to hearing from white leaders when it comes to the topic of race and the need for everyone to take responsibility for addressing racial inequality. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I think one of the things that I'm, I, I am most frustrated by in our Jewish community is on MLK Day when synagogues bring in black choirs from churches that they've, you know, that they have thin relationships with. And it feels great. It feels great to be a white Jew in a synagogue and see a group of black people on stage singing together. And then are you showing up in the work? And I talked about this the other night at the Holocaust Museum. We had an event um, honoring Heschel, uh, honoring Dr. King. And, and I was talking about how like in our Jewish community, there were many people who stepped forward after the Movement for Black Lives platform came out and they're like, I will no longer support Black Lives Matter because it's anti-Semitic. And it's like, where were you? I didn't see you there before. So now you're stepping out of the fight. But when, when were you ever in the fight? And I feel in our Jewish community, we have this, there is a kind of um, softness to the way that we engage in these questions. And the reason I think this is so important in, in light of what um, Heschel's writing here, I mean, take the time and read the whole speech later. It's, he writes, my heart is sick. My heart is sick when I think about the anguish and the sighs, the quiet tears shed in the nights in overcrowded dwellings in the slums of our great cities, of the pangs of despair, of the cup of humiliation that's running over. He says, it's not just policies and laws that matter. And it's not just the big grand gestures that matter. It's the everyday humiliations. It's the degradations. It's the microaggressions. And as long as that persists, he, an immigrant Jew whose family was murdered in Europe, feels guilty. Like he says... Uh, not, not all are guilty, but all are responsible. I'm responsible here too. And so Marissa was pointing out afterwards, like it's inter if, if, before, beforehand, if I, if I may, yeah. that, um, you know, it's interesting because the people who uh, f protest against critical race theory being taught in schools and don't want, don't want our history to be taught, they say we don't want white kids to feel bad about our history. And he is feeling bad about it. He is awake and he is feeling bad, but not in a way that should make us shut down the conversation, but should make us go deeper into the conversation because the fact is there's an infection under the skin and it might make you feel bad to pull back the Band-Aid and see it, but if you don't, it's not gonna heal. And so I wanna, like, I wanna think about this moment that's gripping our nation, the book bans, the you know teachers getting fired for sharing history. This seems like this, there's a, such a reactivity in this moment, which some people I've heard describe as a, an extinction burst. It's like, People know where we're heading, where history's moving. It's not going to be a white majority nation soon. So there's this burst of like reclamation of white supremacist ideology and white nationalism and a fear of like if people if people turn to history, they're going to hate themselves. That'll make white people even weaker versus Heather McGee and, you know, and Dr. King and 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 Rabbi Heschel, who are like, no, we have to feel the pain so that we collectively can pull ourselves out of Egypt. And, and he says, you know, in, he says in another place, the great tragedy of the exodus from Egypt is that the Egyptians could have been redeemed too, but they didn't choose redemption. They chose to drown in the sea. So how do you, how do you see that playing out in this time? 
you know, I, I can't remember who I was hearing on the radio talking about um, democracy is our secular religion. And we are in the process of um, becoming apostate from our secular religion. <laughs> and a lot of what is driving that is white supremacy. There, are, You can hear people now on the the far right talk radio and so forth, essentially saying, yeah, it's okay not to be democratic. It's okay for us to suppress the vote or to keep, you know, to actively be um, uh, subverting our democratic elections because the end justifies the means and the end is that we, you know, we are the uh, appropriate overlords. I don't know. I mean, they don't say it in quite that blatant a way. And, and therefore anything that undermines that is, is justified. It's fine. And so the fact of democracy, we can't take for granted either. And a lot of it is in the name of maintaining a, a status quo that never benefited everybody. It was never a true democracy. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that some of that, um, I, um, you know, it's funny. I, I really resonated with little Benjamin Ellis's um, Devar Torah this afternoon, this morning, because, uh, you know, he asked the question, did Moses see himself as a Jew? Did Moses know that he was an Israelite or Hebrew? Mm -hmm. Did, uh, or, or did he not? Was this, you know, and, and does that affect how you view his actions then uh, when he's an adult and, and his highly flawed adulthood? Um, and I think that that really matters that all Jews should ask themselves how the world sees them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Heschel says in one part here that, um, he says, what afflicts my conscience is that my face, whose skin happens not to be dark, instead of radiating the likeness of God, has come to be taken as an image of haughty assumption and overbearance. Whether justified or not, I, the white man, have become in the eyes of others a symbol of arrogance and pretension, giving offense to other human beings, hurting their pride even without intending it, my very presence inflicting insult. And, I mean, um, we all on this stage carry multiple identities, right? My mom was comes from German stock, my uh, I'm Port and Portuguese Jewish stock. In the but my I'm 100% Jamaican. Both of my parents were born and raised in Jamaica, and I used to look different. But I've kind of aged into being a white lady now. My hair is straight. It wasn't before. A lot of the pigment that I used to have is gone. You know, and people no longer say, what are you? Unless you're from New Orleans, interestingly enough, or Egypt. I've had Egyptians and New Orleanians say, you're, you're Creole, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so my, but, you know, I come from a lot of mixing um, all over, but people don't read me that way. And I feel I just like, okay, what, how do people see me? Did Moses see himself? Yeah. How did, you know, and how does that relate to how I um, move through the world? You know, internally, I might feel one way, but the world is looking at me another way. And that's some of what Heschel's saying here. Internally, I feel one way, but the world is looking at me a different way. And the other piece of this that I find really, really striking is that, you know, the racially restrictive covenants that limited where people could buy housing very famously excluded black people, but almost always also excluded Jews. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the redlining that we still live with, the, the underinvestment and the prohibition on investment or lending in areas that were occupied by black people and Jews, no longer really affect Jews because Jews can move through the world more or less as white people. And I think that affects this affinity that Jews have long felt for, you know, there's that wonderful picture of King and Heschel marching arm in arm, and we had that history together, but our paths have diverged. And so what does that mean that we as Jews now need to do, having walked that path once in our history, recent history, but no longer living that life. People don't necessarily look at you as a Jewish person and identify you as a Jew instantly. It used to be we were more, about whether by dress or other characteristics, we were people, Jewish people were more identifiable and um, just by becoming more affluent in the world and being able to pay for things that you can't if you keep getting um, excluded from the, the regular economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it occurs to me, and, and Jack, would we, we, we share this both coming from multiple mixed bloodlines and being mistaken for many things, that it's, it's not just a question of how do we read ourselves or how do people in the community read us and how often are we gonna get stopped by police or not. 
I think there's an, another question that's lurking in what they're saying here, especially in what Heschel is saying, which is, how does God see you? Uh, and if God's looking at all of this, is God seeing you as an Egyptian or is God seeing you as a Jew? What are you doing? How are you living? And, and how you are living is going to answer the question about whether or not God would see you as part of Pharaoh's house or part of the slave's house. And that I think implicit in, in, in the point that you're making about the way paths have diverged for many of us and the way that many of us have um, had the advantages that come with being in a white supremacist society. And part of the thing that's difficult for, for a lot of folks to wrap their heads around is the dual nature of the positioning of white Jews in America, mm -hmm. to borrow a, 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 a phrase from Dove Kent, that um, white Jews are targets of white nationalism and beneficiaries of white supremacy. Both those things happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard for people to wrap their heads around it. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to these questions of race, of opportunity, of equity, what side of the dividing line are most of us living on? And it's something that Rabbi Arya Cohen asks every year at Passover. Right now, are we Jews or are we Pharaoh? Mm -hmm. Are we Jews, as Jews, are we Jews in the story or are we Egyptians? Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's an uncomfortable question that I think we need to keep wrestling with. And can I just take that a step further? It's not, if, not only are you Jews or are you Pharaoh, but if you are Pharaoh, are you embracing being Pharaoh? Are you accepting and taking all the advantages of being Pharaoh and living with that? Or are you going to recognize that you're Pharaoh and, and um, try and, and redeem that? Right. Know, it was so. Pharaoh's own daughter who stood up and pushed back. From within the right. palace, right? Right. Mm -hmm. right. So yeah. everybody can do something because, I mean, I think I actually look at the par Parshat Shemot as a, it's a guidebook. It's a blueprint for resistance against tyranny. We've talked about this a lot at Ikar, but you literally see how you can fight tyranny, the, the you know, Shifra and Pua, you know, resisting the law. You see you see Yochevet and Miriam <clears throat> resisting through love, and you see Batya resisting inside the halls of power. Like, you know, think of what it means that her own father made the decree, and she is the one who goes out and grabs this child, and she knows what he is. She, she knows exactly who he is, and then gives him to Yochevet to raise him to his own mother, which is such tender and beautiful gift back to a mother who had to say goodbye to her child, which is unthinkable. So I think that's I think that's very powerful. I, you know, I want to bring us to this line that Heschel writes um, on the back page, on page six. He says, "We are all pharaohs or slaves of pharaohs." Okay, that's what Doctor, that's what Rabbi Doctor Arya Cohen says at his seder. But then he goes on to say, "It's sad to be a slave of pharaoh." It's horrible to be a pharaoh. And I just, I, is he right? Is it? Do you agree with him? I think given who he was and <laughs> given his age and given he's saying this in 1963, you could easily trans, you know, you could easily translate that statement into it is sad to be a victim of, a, of the Nazis. It is worse to be a Nazi. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's really what he's saying. And I, and, and I think that there's, from a, from a moral standpoint, from a standpoint of moral culpability, I think he's saying it is it is worse to be a victimizer even than to be the victimized. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it's a very powerful statement for a Jewish man whose family was destroyed in the Shoah to say that not very long after. I mean, this is only what 18 years after the end of World War II, right? This is this is a live memory for a lot of people. It's not something in the distant past, and it's a very bold statement for someone to say it's. You know, you know what's worse than being the victim of a Nazi? Being a Nazi. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of something. I, I quoted Susanna Heschel the other night at this um, King Forum, and I'm going to share it again in case uh, I'm, I'm assuming most of you didn't hear that conversation. Um, but And this is uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel and, and Sylvia Heschel's daughter, Susanna, who's a great scholar. Um, and she... She came here one Shabbos with Clarence Jones, who was Dr. King's <laughs> attorney. You were there, Len. Mm -hmm. uh, were others here that Shabbos some years ago? Brooke was here, Melissa, obviously, and Marty. Um, and Clarence Jones has basically dedicated many decades of his career to reinvigorating the Black Jewish Alliance because he felt like that was the moment when America could have been redeemed because working together, what can we not do? 
And he saw, he sees how the alliance has, you know, essentially like because of all the reasons you're describing, um, has broken and he's been trying. I mean, he, he has conferences where he brings us together and try like, we got to work together. And so we came here and gave this rousing, beautiful call to the, you know, like, thank you to the Jewish community and King and Heschel and Ralph Abernathy, you know, and they marched arm in arm and they were this beautiful image that we all look to. And he said, you know, like we, this is what we have to re reinvigorate to save America. And, um, and, and Susanna Heschel got up and she's like, I gotta be honest, most Jews weren't on the right side of that struggle. She's like, we like to think that they were, everybody loves that image of my father, but Abraham Joshua Heschel was met at the airport in Birmingham, Alabama, when he flew down for the Selma Montgomery March by a group of local rabbis who were like, go back to New York. You're going to incite anti-Semitism down here. Like, we, this is like 20 years after the Shoah. People don't like Jews. It, by the way, listen to Rachel Maddow's Ultra. I, I was not, I know, we're, at least we have to talk about this. I was not fully aware of how deeply entrenched um, that anti-Semitism was in the highest levels of, uh, of, of office and power in America. There was real anti-Semitism we were contending with, but these rabbis were afraid. And they said, we can't, like, we just have to stay, we have to be Switzerland here, right? We got to stay neutral. And Dr. King's like, I, and, and, um, and Rabbi Heschel said, I'm like, I'm going and you need to come too. And she said, not only were the Jews, like, were, were the masses of Jews not behind us in this struggle, but they're not now. And so instead of resting on our laurels, we got to build something completely new today. And it was a very powerful moment to hear that testimony in our community. And I actually think it, I think it meant something to our community. Like, where are we? We can't just keep saying like, well, we marched with King and why are you, you know, Kanye, why are you saying mean things about us? We were there in, you know, 50 years ago. And it's like, where are you now? Where are we now? And that, that I think is such a powerful call that both of them uh, are, are calling to us. And the vision of that the Egyptians could have also been redeemed, that Pharaoh could have been redeemed is such an important mission because there can be no redemption for America that leaves half the population behind. And so a multiracial America, a multiracial democracy, which is our dream, also has to make way for chuva, for people to, for people who are on the wrong side of history to step onto the right side of history. The truth and reconciliation, like we have to have our own version of a truth and reconciliation that's a, that that fe might feel unfair, but is a pathway for everybody to be able to stand together on on this side of the sea. Well, in the middle of page six, Heschel says we must act even when inclination and vested interest would militate against equality. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that really yeah. applies here because I think ultimately our vested interest is in everyone rising up, but the narrow self-interest can make it seem like, well, there's in this, if you picture the world as a zero sum game, your gain is my loss. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's just really, uh, he says, uh, human self-interest is often our nemesis. It is the audacity of faith that redeems us. Required is a breakthrough, a leap of action, not just a leap of faith, but a leap of action. It is the deed that will purify the heart. It is the deed that will sanctify the mind. The deed is the test, the trial, and the risk. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder if, I wonder if uh, the whole, what you were saying before, if, uh, you know, the, the ultra-right right now is saying, you know, uh, I'm okay with getting rid of democracy mm -hmm. if uh, the ends of us keeping in power will will justify those means. And I don't know exactly the whole demographic shifts of of um, the Jewish community in the United States, but I wonder if there's some of that in there, in that mm -hmm. the ends justify the means. Okay, well, we're gonna, we're gonna shut our eyes to the racism here so that we can get ahead. We're gonna shut our eyes and not join forces because in the end there will be some advantage to us um, neglecting the, the fact that there is still so, uh, you know, everyone is, is uh, that racism affects everyone. Right. And that our destinies are truly entwined with one another. That it's, it, it, I mean, the whole idea of shared liberation, that, that one people can't be liberated while another remains oppressed is real. And I, I think they both use the language of cancer. Like when there's a cancer in the system, it doesn't matter if it's in, you know, if the cancer's in your leg, that means your whole system is, is jeopardized. And so what does it mean to actually try to errat to do the work together 
to eradicate that illness from the collective body um, of our of our society. So, okay, the hour's late. I would love if we could take just like maybe two comments, uh, or I'm sorry, two questions, um, and then we'll wrap, and this will be an ongoing conversation for us, obviously, uh, for the days ahead. Does anyone have a, a thought or question that you want to share? Rabbi Len? Go on. <laughs> oh, wow. You're right. Oh. January 14th. Can you, you know what? We're streaming. Can you maybe come up here and just use one of our microphones? So, oh, is that? <laughs> <laughs> Said Rabbi Len Miraf. <laughs> so uh, that day, I like what our rabbi pointed out, which is that uh, Susanna Heschel said, Jews have to take down that picture of my father marching with Dr. King because, okay, you can't rest on his laurels. But then Clarence Jones also said, and black people, I have to say to them, don't hate the Jews, because back then Jews were, and it wasn't only Dr. Uh, Rabbi Heschel that so many Jews were involved. And so I think in each case, it's just being locked in a space and not having perspective either forward or back. So I just wonder where, when we intersect with people that are different from us, how do we help them see other than the present reality so that it's like not being myopic, but looking at things from a macro level, and how do we try to move things forward in that spirit of the two great people that spoke a few years ago? Mm. I, you know, my, my quick answer to that question is to be honest about the history without um, falling prey to the lure of mythology. Mm. Like it did, it is true that Heschel did what he did and that others did what they did and they spoke out and they spoke out with conscience and they spoke out with courage. That is true. And it is true that there were fewer of them than were necessary. Mm -hmm. That is also true. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's using the history honestly without falling for the mythology, which is disempowering. If you're just invoking Heschel like a saint and that somehow his marching redeemed your sins, you know, this is a very kind of Christian framework that I think often a lot of Jews have when thinking about Heschel, not as a spur to action, but as a, a, a kind of paradigm that can say he's redeemed us. Well, that's not, that's not the way it actually mm. works. So my answer to that question is to be honest about the history without falling into the lore of mythology and use the history for what it's worth honestly and to engage with, 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 with our ancestors who did this kind of work as exemplars that we should strive towards as opposed to assuming that they've done all the hard work and we should just reap the rewards. You know, it's interesting, right before, right as Ikar was starting, uh, there was a rabbi in LA who was just retiring just as we were beginning and he took me out to lunch and he said, and this was like a great hero in the justice spaces and somebody who, um, you know, had met with all the right people, stood with all the right people, like clearly brave and courageous. And he said, do not build a rabbinate like my rabbinate. And I said, what are you talking about? You're like one of the, you know, Gedolim and one of the greats. And he said, my people loved that I was at all the right marches and that I had all the right photos and that I had all the right experiences and none of them got up off their butts to do the work because mm -hmm. they made me a proxy for them. And he said, don't, he said, I realized at some point I was an entertainer. Mm. And, um, and so, and we really took that seriously at the beginning of Ikar and like really thought about, you know, and by the way, this is part of the reason why we have a, like a full-time position for director of community organizing. It's like, well, this is why we have Minyan Sedek leadership. That is the strongest, most powerful lay leadership. This is like, we are not, we're not interested in like the symbolic gesture. As much as I love a great black choir, there's a reason that we didn't have a church here this morning. And it's because we actually have to continually push ourselves all of us to be um, to be in the work in that way. And I think what Susanna was saying is, don't turn my father into a proxy for your own behavior, like get into the struggle. I also wanna say one last thing, which is I think the more vulnerable, we talked about this a little bit when Reverend Najuma Smith Pollard was here a couple weeks ago, that when there's a, when there's a spike in anti-Semitism, Jews, like we do instinctively what all people do, which is we kind of close ranks. And we turn closer to each other and we entrench uh, even more because we're feeling vulnerable and it's a very natural biological reaction. And, um, and I think in this time when there is a, you know, there is a, a spike in anti-Semitism in the country and in the world, 
Um, I think I see our community doing that. And, and Len, to answer your question, I think the answer is we have to do something really counter instinctual, which is instead of turning in, we have to continue to turn out, especially when we're feeling vulnerable and let our vulnerability help us attach to other people who are also feeling vulnerable because there are other people who are also incredibly vulnerable right now, even more so than our Jewish community. And so this has to be like an active counter intuition that we're engaging in um, to, to, to use the moment of vulnerability to, to expose ourselves more rather than less as a gesture of love and a promise of solidarity that ultimately will help bring about this shared redemption. Can I, I, I actually think that that's actually, it's actually counterintuitive to turn inward. Um, I would think that, I mean, the animal, sorry, um, in the animal kingdom um, and for humans as well, you're, there's strength in numbers, right? We actually go to community. I mean, there, there. Are, when I was saying the animal kingdom, there's you know exhibits of, of, of animals you know that would normally be uh, a prey and predator that work together um, to uh, if, if if there's a drought and they're looking for for water. There's examples of that, and th that's the thing. Um, it actually we should be working together, and you would think that that would actually be the normal way and course. For us so to go inward um uh, i just it just it makes me think that that's not the way it should be mm -hmm. also to what rabbi len was saying um i think it's easy to other those people who don't just who don't agree with us as well and that that also harms us i mean the, we a lot of the people who've fallen prey to some of these narratives and fallen for the idea that you know you might be poor but at least you're not black and all of that stuff mm -hmm. Um, they, I, I always have this little phrase that I keep in my head. They honor their parents. They love their children, mm -hmm. whatever else they are. They most likely honor their parents and love their children. Mm -hmm. I honor my parents and I love my children. We can start from there. Something somewhere has to help me connect to them because it's frankly, it's part of how we got through the Trump administration, right? Because as much as he was pulling out all of these evil impulses from people, things that I see as evil, they didn't necessarily see them as evil. They thought saw them as maybe protecting their families or trying to deal with their own economic challenges. And so it's, I think it's really important to, as you say, not close in, but take that as an opportunity to find some little smidge of something as a way of, of opening up and finding a commonality so you can have the conversation. But I, I, keep, I wanna come back to though, the idea that it's, a lot of it is about black people. It really is about black people. And uh, go, just going to Karen Bass, I'm really glad that um, Karen Bass is mayor. I think if anyone can make a dent in a homelessness, it's her. It is not coincidental that black people make up, what, eight, nine percent of the population of LA County. They are, depending on who you're counting, um, 50, 60 percent of homeless people. Mm. If you look at housing policies, mm. I'm dealing with this right now. Um, there's a uh, a woman who is, she's a cancer survivor. She looks 50, but she's only 36. She uh, just had a stroke. She's disabled. She's waiting for a heart transplant. And she got, did, she's done, she's a very act, she's smart and she's a very active advocate in her own behalf. She's trying to keep herself housed. She has housing now. She's got an eviction notice, complicated reasons. Um, and so the, the new way that we're excluding people from housing is credit ratings. Mm. Who has the worst credit ratings? Black people. Mm -hmm. Why? History of poverty. Why do we have that history of poverty? Because black people have historically been excluded from ways of building wealth. We made trillions of dollars of investment in the, uh, lifting up the white middle class in this country and we forget and, and deny the fact that black people were excluded from that public investment. Mm -hmm. And we've got to try to get past that now and really focus on leveling that playing field and helping black people as a group lift up to where everybody else got because of the investments we made, whether it was in housing, jobs, education, that were completely unavailable if your skin was dark. Mm. I, I will. We can. We can. Uh, thank you for saying that. Um, I just read um, my friend Reverend Otis Moss uh, the Third just put out a book called Dancing in the Darkness, and he's going to come here and he'll speak. And 
Um, and we're hopefully doing a podcast in the coming couple of days. And the book is beautiful. And he talks, there's one story in here that, that he tells um, about a black uh, couple um, free, I think freed slaves who were end up, um, they have a home and they build a business and they end up becoming quite wealthy and they have a, a pretty massive property. And then white folks come in with guns and take the property and it's gone. And he, and what he does is such an interesting exercise. Like if that, if they had been able to hold that wealth and that imagining their descendants who would have inherited the wealth and then their descendants and their descendants, and there would have been a holding of black inherited wealth just from that one family alone. And so like, what is it, what does it mean for us to actually reckon with the reality of that? I'm going to just close with a story from his book because I love it. And, um, it feels like a good close for us to this, um, the, uh, again, the book is called Dancing in the Darkness. And um, I shared this story uh, once some years ago, so you may remember it. But um, Reverend Otis Moss, is the, he's the reverend at, um, at, at the Trinity Church in Chicago, which uh, was President Obama's former church when he lived in Chicago. And there, they went through a horrible period um, when the sermons of Jeremiah, of Reverend Jeremiah Wright, became public, and they were read by people who were very, like, had never, had never heard or seen anything like that before, and got very angry. And there were all kinds of bomb threats, and um, it was a very dangerous time. And so, uh, Reverend Otis Moss describes that one night he's in bed and he hears this uh, loud noise in his house, and he's very scared. And his wife's like, you got to go figure out what that is. And he says, like, I picked up my, my rod and my staff, which says Louisville Slugger on it. And he goes down through the house and he's like trying to see what the noise is in the house. And um, he hears that it's coming from his little daughter, Michaela's room. And so he opens up the door and Michaela is in the dark in the middle of the night dancing around the room. Hmm. And she's jumping and thumping and dancing. And he's like, Michaela, what are you doing? And she's like, Daddy. I'm dancing. Hmm. Come dance with me. And he's like, we're not dancing. It's three in the morning. Like get back in bed. And she's like, but daddy, I'm dancing. And he's so angry. And then he takes a moment and he realizes, and he says like, my daughter, Michaela was dancing in the darkness. And like, she found a way even in all of the struggle to still fill her heart with, with joy, with like real, with real joy. And so I, and I feel like that's part of what makes both of these teachers of ours prophets which is there's always in a, in a prophecy in that we read in like the Haftarah every Shabbos, it always ends on a good note. Even the most despairing prophecies, they'll sometimes take a positive note from another place and put it in at the end. It's called the Nechemta. There's always a Nechemta because there's always the possibility that something's going to get better, even in the darkest moments. And I think having the benefit of, you know, of um, being able to look look at the past now and see the way that he was so hopeful in 56 and then things got worse and then they got better and worse. And like when you're in the midst of history, it's hard to see um, where it's going to go and how it could continue to get better. And yet, um, and yet part of our charge is to figure out ways to dance in the darkness, even as we continue on the trajectory toward a more just society. So I thank you so much. Um, we're so blessed to have you, uh, your friendship, your leadership, your voices. Um, may God bless all three of you um, with great strength and with continued moral clarity. Um, and thank you for, for all of the Torah that you share uh, with our community and with the world. Thank you. And thanks to everybody here. Um, 